Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is the hallmarks of cancer part one, growth. Very excited to be presenting this material because it is absolutely critical that you have a strong foundation in these concepts as a future physician, pathology assistant, nurse, uh, physician assistant, anyone who's involved uh, in healthcare, because these are critical for understanding the pathogenesis of malignancy. And malignancy is something that affects all of us, either through our patients, uh, through the specimens that we address, uh, ourselves, our friends, our family. Uh, so cancer is something that all of us will uh, experience. I'm going to begin by reviewing regulation of the cell cycle, because it is disruption of the cell cycle that drives us towards malignancy. I'm then going to analyze three hallmarks of cancer that are associated with cell growth and proliferation. These are self-sufficiency in growth signals, insensitivity to growth inhibitory signals, and altered cellular metabolism. Now, what are these hallmarks of cancer? They're actually a concept that has been evolving uh, over the last uh, 22 years. Uh, so back in 2000, uh, Hannah Hannon Weinberg uh, wrote a paper where they wanted to provide a framework uh, to uh, understand the physiology underlying malignancy. Now, as you're going through your studies, you're going to learn the different details about many, many malignancies, lung cancer, skin cancer, melanoma, leukemias, lymphomas. And you might get so focused on each of those individuals that you miss the big picture, what do they have in common? What do all malignancies need to have in order to survive and to uh, be successful as malignant tumors? And these hallmarks are looking at the, uh, the overall basis for malignancy. So uh, in 2000, uh, Hannah Hannon Weinberg uh, proposed these uh, six hallmarks of cancer, uh, evading apoptosis, self-sufficiency in growth signals, uh, insensitivity to anti-growth signals, tissue invasion and metastasis, limitless replicative uh, potential, and sustained angiogenesis. So they thought these six things, this is what tumor cells need. 11 years later, they added a few more, uh, they called emerging hallmarks. So uh, dysregulate, dysregulating uh, cellular uh, energetics. So this is the Warburg phenomenon, which we'll talk about in this video. Avoiding uh, immune uh, destruction, which I'll talk about in uh, the next video, as well as some enabling characteristics. So it's not just what these cancer cells have in common, but what causes them to become malignant in the first place. So they uh, included tumor promoting inflammation, uh, and genome instability and mutation. And what we have now in 2022, this is the uh, graphic that you can see uh, in the Robbins uh, Pathology textbooks. Uh, these are these eight, these six plus these two, and includes the enabling characteristics. Uh, so uh, here you can see them uh, in words for those of you who can't uh, simply interpret the, uh, the icons. Uh, the icons can be useful uh, for those of you who are more visual. Uh, in this video, I'm going to address these first three, as I already mentioned. Uh, these five I will address uh, in the next video, as well as uh, future uh, implications for therapeutics uh, involving all of the hallmarks of cancer and the enabling factors. But before we start talking about cancer, we have to prepare the soil. We have to discuss what the normal cell looks like so we can begin trying to figure out how tumor cells get around this. So here we have uh, the cell cycle. Uh, this is something that I learned in high school and multiple times afterwards, so this should all be very familiar, but always good for a refresher, because now we're going to look at it with fresh eyes. So how does a tumor cell subvert this machinery? So here we have uh, our cell, which is in G1. It can either have come just from cell division, moving right on into gap phase in our continually proliferating cells like gastrointestinal epithelial cells, or it could be a quiescent cell that's sitting there quietly, but receives some sort of growth factor signal that says it's time for you to uh, replicate, moving on into G1. And in G1, the cell is going to become larger, it's going to duplicate its centrosomes, and as it gets to this point here, this called restriction point, once it passes here, it no longer needs growth factors to drive it towards cell proliferation. Now it's going to pause, for a uh, check for DNA damage here at the G1S uh, transition. And this is important because if you have damage to your DNA, some sort of mutation, a deletion, amplification, you don't want to synthesize that bad DNA. It's as if uh, you were uh, copying uh, a paper and you had a typo in it. You're gonna check that before you make a thousand copies to send out to all of your classmates. So this is where uh, the cell takes a look. Is there anything awry? We're good, 
move on through duplication. We're going to synthesize uh, our DNA. And then we're going to pause again. We have to rest. We have to build up some more organelles. And we're going to check again for damaged or unduplicated DNA at the G2M checkpoint uh, because you can get errors during duplication. So you want to make sure you haven't gotten any. Because at this point, once you go through here, if you have an error, that's going to go through uh, into your additional cells. Now, if you're a detective and you're thinking, where are some areas that we could subvert the cell cycle? One area would be here, where you don't check for your DNA and damage, and therefore you get uh, some errors propagating through. Another uh, area here where you could subvert it would be uh, at this point. And you could actually do it here at the G0, so about the growth factors telling you to replicate. So we'll look at that more in a little bit more detail. But first, let's talk again about normal cell proliferation. What drives that cell that's sitting there to say, time to, to uh, duplicate myself and move on? Because this is important to recognize so we can understand what neoplastic cell proliferation looks like. So typically, you have a cell sitting there quietly, uh, and a growth factor binds to a receptor on the cell membrane and says, get going, it's time for you to replicate. This is going to uh, activate uh, that growth factor receptor, uh, in a transient limited uh, way. So you don't want it to just bind and turn on because then once you have one binding, then you're going to get this constant drive towards proliferation. So it's going to extinguish itself after it activates signal transducing proteins that are located on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. We're going to get transmission of that signal from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Uh, and you're going to see multiple uh, figures and images of this in scientific papers, and I'll show you one in this as well. And they can get really complicated because this is, this is not just some small linear thing. There are so many uh, cascades uh, for signal amplification. We'll try to keep it simple for this video. Once we uh, get to the nucleus, the whole point of all this is to uh, drive the transcriptions of genes that are necessary for cell division. And then once you have that, we're going to enter into and progress through the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is very tightly regulated because, again, autonomous growth is the definition of neoplasia. And the body wants cells to duplicate when necessary, stop when it's not necessary. And the way that we regulate the cell cycle is through a variety of proteins. So the cyclins uh, are called that because they have a cyclical expression in the cell. And they regulate progression by binding to cyclin-dependent kinases. And when they bind to cyclin-dependent kinases, those kinases will now be activated. They'll get their uh, catalytic activity, and they can phosphorylate key proteins such as RB. And there's a separate video just on RB and P53 because they're so important to malignancy. Now, we don't just have our cyclin-dependent kinases. As always, it's checks and balances. We have cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, or CDKIs. And they're going to regulate the CDK cyclin complexes and enforce those two checkpoints we just talked about. And here's a list of uh, some of the uh, CDKIs. Uh, that I don't think it's uh, necessary to memorize these. Uh, it is important to recognize that uh, CDK4 and CDK6 are particularly important, and P16 you're going to see uh, again and again uh, as we discuss uh, malignancies. So here's a figure uh, that again shows our regulation of the cell cycle, uh, where you can see here we have our, cyclin, uh, our cyclins in this blue. They're like a little relay race where we have cyclin D passing off to cyclin E, passing off to cyclin A, and cyclin B. Uh, we have our cyclin uh, CDK4, our cyclin-dependent kinases, that are going to bind to our cyclins, and these are the inhibitors uh, that are involved. And here, again, is our, our, two, our two checkpoints, uh, and this is the point where RB gets phosphorylated. Again, recommend the P53 RB video to understand why this is so critical. So with this basic understanding, let's talk about our first hallmark of cancer, self-sufficiency and growth signals. So obviously, if the cell doesn't have to wait for a growth signal, but can just keep proliferating, this is going to drive us towards, uh, towards neoplasia. And what this typically is due to is a gain of function mutation that's going to convert proto-oncogenes to oncogenes that promote cell growth. And there are a variety of different ways uh, that cells can do this. So one is through making its own growth factors. So instead of waiting patiently for a growth factor to come, if I make my own growth factor, then I can have this autocrine stimulation. Most cells do not have autocrine stimulation because that's a bad idea. It means you don't need anybody else. You can just do it all by yourself.
Another way that uh, tumor cells get around this, uh, and the, the waiting, the endless waiting for the growth factor, is to induce the stromal cells around them, uh, fibroblasts and other stromal cells, uh, to make growth factors. This is why the stroma is so important in malignancy. Another way that uh, tumor cells can become self-sufficient is by amplifying their growth factor receptors. So if you have lots of growth factor receptors out there, that's going to increase the opportunity for binding. Example of this is HER2, which we see in breast cancer. Now, I'm going to go in more detail in the next slide about this next uh, mechanism, which is uh, through signal transducing molecules, through the, trans, uh, through the constitutive activation of these so that they don't need to shut down uh, while waiting for the next growth factor to come along. And then the classic example of this is RAS. I'm going to go through that in detail in a figure in the next slide. Another possibility, since the whole point of all this is to drive transcription, what if you just had a whole bunch of nuclear transcription factors? So uh, one uh, that we see frequently that is uh, amplified in malignancies is MYC. And when you have a lot of MYC, it's going to increase the transcription of your cyclin-dependent kinases. So that's driving you through the cell cycle, as well as in genes involved in altered metabolism, which we'll talk about at the end of this video. And finally, you could have mutations uh, in your actual uh, cyclins or in your cyclin-dependent kinases uh, so that they're constitutively active. So that would be, for example, CDK4 and cyclin D. Now, as I mentioned, I want to go back uh, to uh, signal transducing molecules because it actually brings a lot of this together. So here we have uh, a cell. Uh, that is uh, a healthy, uh, happy cell. It's not uh, in a state of neoplasia. Uh, this is its growth factor receptor sitting there in the plasma membrane. Here comes the growth factor, right? That is going to cause this transient activation. We have an adapter protein that's going to activate RAS uh, by uh, phosphorylating uh, GDP. So this is activated. Now, RAS has uh, an internal GTPase that's going to uh, hydrolyze that phosphate, making it inactive. So these are uh, uh, GTP binding proteins. Uh, so in this uh, transient activation, uh, RAS is going to uh, can set up the variety of different uh, signaling pathways. One is the RAF uh, MAP kinase. The other is the PI3K AKT pathway. Uh, you're going to see uh, these uh, proteins mentioned again and again. So it's worth knowing what they do and their involvement uh, in uh, malignancy. So once you have activation of these pathways, it's going to increase transcription of the pro-growth genes. So we're going to get uh, proteins that uh, are pro-growth metabolism, increase protein synthesis, and drive us towards cell cycle progression, leading us to cell growth. Now, this whole process is seen in normal healthy cells because uh, as this growth factor is necessary and saying, let's go ahead and replicate, uh, then we're going to have activation. This is going to be transient and, uh, and the cell will then rest. Now, it's important here that we inactivate RAS. Uh, so this can be uh, through GTPase uh, activating proteins. NF1 is one of those. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you can see where you can have a variety of errors that are going to drive you uh, to the ability to, uh, to replicate and proliferate without growth factor uh, stimulation. So for example, you can have um, some sort of uh, mutation in a growth factor receptor. You can have one in RAS, so it does not deactivate. Uh, and then we also have proteins that act to uh, inhibit these pathways, such as P10. P10 we're going to see uh, in um, a variety of different malignancies, including endometrial carcinoma. So that's how the cells are able to, uh, to grow without growth factors. At the same time, they also have to be insensitive to growth inhibitory signals because the body is not going to let cells just grow and grow. It has checks and balances. So if it notes a cell is beginning to proliferate, it's going to have growth inhibitory signals. And when we see in, what we see in, in tumor cells is that this insensitivity to growth inhibitory signals is often due to loss of function mutations of tumor suppressor genes. So it's um, going to make cells refractory to growth inhibition, and the, it's going to mimic the growth promoting e effects of oncoproteins, of oncogenes. So two of these are so important that they have a separate video, RB and P53. Uh, I recommend that you watch that. Here are some others that are discussed in Robbins. I'll talk about them briefly because they're going to show up later in this video.
So trans uh, transforming growth factor beta, uh, its uh, usual function is to enhance cyclin-dependent kinase uh, inhibitor transcription, so to slow down uh, proliferation. It also represses CDK4, uh, so cyclin-dependent kinase 4, and MYC transcription. So when you have this uh, function knocked out, then we are going to reduce our inhibition, and we're going to increase uh, our activity of CDK4 and MYC. Uh, another uh, set of uh, proteins that are mentioned uh, in the textbook are E. cadherin and NF2. Both of these are going to see again uh, in Robbins when we talk about breast cancer and gastric carcinoma, uh, as well as some of the uh, uh, tumor syndromes. And this is an important concept. Uh, you know, if you've noticed, if you if you noticed your own body, you have a, a cut and it heals. It stops. Once, once the cells touch each other, that's it. You don't get this immense proliferation. And this is because cells are resistant to piling up on each other. So this is called contact inhibition. And we can see this very easily in the laboratory. If you put some fibroblasts or other cells in a Petri dish, they'll grow. And once they touch each other, they stop, they stop growing. However, if they're malignant, they'll pile up. They'll form a little tumor ball. Uh, and so these cells are involved in contact inhibition. If you knock these out, uh, this uh, uh, prevents that growth inhibitory uh, signal. And then we have uh, APC, which is an adenomatous polyposis coli uh, gene or protein, which is a negative regulator of Wnt signaling. And I'm going to go through this again in a figure because uh, we're going to see this uh, again, particularly when we look at gastrointestinal uh, carcinomas. So I wanted to review for you Wnt signaling. So here we have a healthy cell, right? Uh, and uh, there's no signaling. So what the cell does is it makes this protein called APC, which forms a destruction complex. Now there's a protein called beta-catenin, uh, which uh, you'll see again and again. It has two functions. It has a structural function where it binds to e-cadherin, our friend e-cadherin, which we're gonna see in the next video. Uh, and it also is a, uh, involved in uh, driving a gene transcription. So without signaling, the, the, the cell is saying, I don't need transcription, we're not proliferating, so we have this destruction complex which is going to destroy beta-catenin, uh, no translocation to the nucleus, no proliferation. However, when appropriate, we get signaling through the Wnt pathway. When Wnt is activated, it is going to inactivate uh, our destruction complex. This means that beta-catenin levels are going to build up since it's not being destroyed. At a certain level, they can translocate to the nucleus, bind to this um, TCF, and drive transcription, leading us to proliferation. And where we see this in malignancy is in familial adenomatous polyposis uh, syndrome, FAP, and in that, if you have a mutation to APC, then even without Wnt signaling, you're going to have uh, deactivation of our uh, destruction complex. It can't form because it's lacking a key protein. Beta-catenin levels will similarly increase, similar to what we see with Wnt stimulation. Beta-catenin will translocate to the nucleus and drive cell proliferation. Okay, so we've looked at two ways that cells can use these uh, hallmarks of cancer to begin proliferating by proliferating autonomously and independently and by resisting growth inhibition. So now that you're growing, how do you grow? Because the cells aren't really set up in our body for constant growth. So we need to find some way to get what we need for these tumor cells to proliferate. And the way, one way they do this is through altered cellular metabolism, um, which is uh, known as the Warburg effect. Uh, and this is where tumor cells, uh, as well as other dividing uh, cells, use aerobic glycolysis. Now, I'm sure you spent a lot of time learning the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, uh, and you know that you get 36 molecules of ATP per molecule, but sorry, 36 moles of ATP through for each mole of uh, glucose. And this is, you know, very uh, efficient. You get lots of energy and, and generally want to generate energy. But in the Warburg effect, in, glyc in aerobic glycolysis, we only get four moles of ATP for each mole of glucose. Uh, and so why would any tumor cell want to do this? Because clearly energy is always good. Well, one reason is going to be that through aerobic glycolysis, you're going to increase the metabolic intermediates that you need for cell growth. Because while energy is good, if you're rapidly proliferating, it's not all about energy. You have to generate all of these building blocks so you can replicate the DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, and organelles. And just having a lot of energy is not going to do that. You need those intermediates. So the way the cell does this is that it begins uh, taking up more glucose and more glutamine, 
and it converts glucose to lactate through fermentation instead of going through uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Now let me uh, show you an image of this because I think pictures for me particularly as a pathologist are so much clearer than words. Uh, so here we have in our differentiated tissue, so say a cardiac myocyte. Cardiac myocyte getting uh, abundant oxygen is going to take glucose, go through, uh, generate pyruvate through glycolysis. That pyruvate is going to enter our uh, mitochondria here, undergo oxidative phosphorylation, give us lots of ATP so that cardiac myocyte can keep pumping. But now we have uh, an infarct. Say we have a thrombus, it's occluding a coronary uh, artery. Uh, now we have our glucose. Uh, and we don't have oxygen, so we're going to generate our pyruvate through glycolysis, but we can't go through uh, the mitochondria because we need oxygen for uh, the final step here in, uh, in the Krebs cycle. So this pyruvate is going to be driven instead uh, through anaerobic glycolysis to form uh, lactic acid. And as you're aware from uh, earlier in uh, the video series, as well as through reading Robbins, uh, when you increase your lactic acid, that's going to decrease your pH. This is going to affect enzyme activity. This is why uh, we can get, when we get anaerobic glycolysis, uh, the cells can't last very long before they start to die. We only get two moles of ATP per mole of glucose. However, we have an entirely different pathway that uh, proliferating tissue and tumors can use. And this is they can go through aerobic glycolysis. So even though they have uh, abundant oxygen and in theory could generate lots of ATP, they say, nah, we're not gonna do that. We're going to drive towards lactate. We're still gonna use a little bit of our pyruvate to generate uh, some uh, ATP because that's always good, uh, but we're going to be driving mostly down this pathway. Now, why would we do this? Again, to generate intermediates. And I'm going to show you a picture that goes through what these intermediates are and how it all comes together. But first I'm going to discuss the mechanism for how we uh, undergo aerobic glycolysis. How does the cell uh, change itself so it can use this process? So there are three uh, mechanisms that are involved. One is going to be growth factor signaling, uh, in which the cell will get a signal and it will begin increasing glucose uh, uptake. It's also going, these, this growth factor signaling is going to inhibit uh, pyruvate kinase, which is that final step uh, that's going to take us to uh, pyruvate and take us into uh, the Krebs cycle. When you do this, you're going to get a buildup of the uh, upstream glycolytic intermediate. So you're going to form this pool that can then be driven towards RNA, DNA, and protein synthesis. Another mechanism is through RAS signaling. So RAS uh, is going to increase the activity of glucose transporters, uh, bringing in more glucose, increase the activity of glycolytic enzymes, drive into store glycolysis. So we're going to have uh, our intermediates. It's also going to have an effect in the mitochondria to shunt mitochondrial intermediates to lipid biosynthesis. You need that for your membranes, for your organelles, and your plasma membrane. And it's also going to increase factors that stimulate protein synthesis. And finally, here comes MYC again. MYC is going to increase gene expression for anabolic metabolism and cell growth, such as glutaminase, which is needed for the mitochondrial utilization of glutamine. Remember, those are the two uh, molecules that we're going to be using in aerobic glycolysis. So let's look at that figure. This comes from uh, Robbins and Kumar, Basic Pathology, 11th edition. So here we have our quiescent cell. Uh, it's really just sort of hanging out, um, getting a little bit of glucose in, going through our Krebs cycle, uh, and generating our 36 ATP because we're not, we're not trying to, uh, to replicate. Now in this growing cell, which can either be a healthy cell that's proliferating or tumor, a lot more is going on. So let's begin here with this growth factor uh, binding to the receptor tyrosine kinase. So here we have RAS signaling, which is going to uh, cause upregulation, sorry, it's going to cause upregulation of PI3K and AKT. AKT is going to drive uh, protein synthesis, and we're also going to get blockage of pyruvate kinase here. Now, when we bring in our glucose, uh, remember, we're going to uh, increase our glucose uh, transporter activity, bringing in more glucose, and we're going to increase our uh, glycolytic enzymes, uh, is going to drive us through glycolysis, but we can't go all the way through to pyruvate because we're blocking pyruvate kinase. So all of these intermediates are building up. They can then be used for nucleotide uh, and amino acid synthesis. AKT is going to uh, drive us towards protein synthesis. And then acetyl-CoA is important uh, for lipogenesis. So as we come here, remember RAS is going to have uh, an impact here driving us towards lipogenesis. 
Uh, I mentioned Mick about uh, increasing uh, glutamine utilization. Uh, that's going to <clears throat> increase uh, glutaminase, giving us glutamate, which can be used here, uh, driving us towards growth. So all of these combine uh, to drive uh, the cell uh, to be able to uh, replicate and proliferate. So it's not just, so when we talked about um, becoming autonomous uh, from growth factors as well as resistance to growth inhibition, we similarly have to have factors driving us towards um, pro-growth pathways, and we have to get around uh, the factors that are inhibiting pro-growth pathways. So here are some of the uh, factors that are involved in that. NF1, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is a GTPase activating protein and regulates downstream signaling. Uh, so we'll see this uh, being knocked out in uh, some malignancies. Uh, P10, uh, also mentioned before, is a tumor suppressor, which is a break on PI3 and AKT signaling cascade. Uh, so we knock that out to drive us uh, towards, um, uh, towards proliferation. Uh, and then P53 uh, is involved as well. So uh, in addition to its, its role as guardian of the genome, it has other functions that are uh, anti-proliferative. Uh, and so it, dry, it inhibits uh, glucose uptake and glycolysis, lipo uh, lipogenesis, and generation of NADPH, which is needed for biosynthesis of macromolecules. So these are all uh, genes that you will see again and again as you study each malignancy. And I, I challenge you as you learn, oh, this is frequently mutated in this cancer, or this is frequently mutated in that cancer, to think, what is that? mutation do, because this will help you to be a better physician by understanding the pathophysiology, maybe come up with a novel uh, therapeutic approach by understanding uh, that disease. Um, now we can use uh, the Warburg effect uh, clinically. I know that all of you are, are familiar with uh, PET-CT. Uh, before this was developed, if you were looking at a patient such as this one who has uh, lung carcinoma, you do a CT scan and the radiologist would look very carefully to see if there were masses. It can really be hard because there's a lot going on here in the mediastinum. So in positron electron tomography, we use uh, radio-labeled glucose. Remember, tumor cells are very glucose avid, so they're going to be sucking up glucose and that's going to concentrate. So here in this particular uh, PET scan, uh, you can see there are areas that have a lot of avidity. But it can be a little difficult to make out what's going on where, so we combine these two in a PET CT, and you can see uh, through some, uh, and then they, they do some manipulations on the, on the signal, you can see these are the bright areas, this is where there is tumor. Uh, and using, and, and it's active tumor, so you can get uh, a rough idea um, if a tumor has responded to uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy by seeing if the signal uh, disappears. Uh, you can also use this to scan and see where are there uh, metastases. Uh, so this is a very useful technique. Uh, as usual, I'm going to finish up with some questions. You can go ahead and hit pause and see if uh, you can answer these. If not, watch the video again. Uh, I hope that you have found this uh, useful. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, uh, send me an email, check out my website, and as always, put comments down below. They're always much appreciated. Thank you very much for your time.